Siempre. Uh, Nina boleh start aku lah? Okay. Okay, Assalamualaikum and uh, very good morning. Welcome to our Neuro Emergency Webinar Series uh, for November 2013. It's only 23, sorry. Okay, today we have two topics. Uh, first topic is about uh, evaluating aspect score in acute ischemic stroke uh, setting by Dr. Hairudi Ahmad Shankala. And for the second topic is about um, um sorry uh the the APT in TIA what is the evidence okay um before we start with our first lecture let me introduce about Dr Ahmad Hairudin um actually this is my first time encounter with Dr Hairudin um Dr Hairudin is a neurologist uh, oh was speaking sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, everybody boleh dengar ke? Yes. Very, very okay. clear. Yes, can. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Hairudin is a neurologist from Hospital Kuala Lumpur. Um, he got her first, her first degree in uh, medicine from University Technology Mara, UITM in 2009. And he obtained the, his uh, postgraduate uh, apa, master in radiology from UST Malaya in 2017. Currently, um, working in hospital Kuala Lumpur as a neurologist, and he obtained his fellowship in neurology from Ministry of Health Malaysia in 2023, and he's also a fellow in neurology from Australia in 2023. Um, he's I think the he's uh, quite um um apa, uh, involved in the international membership for the radiology especially in neurology such as the radio uh, royal college of uh, radiologists in from uk and also the uh, she also the member from the uh, of the korean society of the radiology okay uh, i think we, uh, without any further ado i would like to invite dr hairid ahmad uh, to deliver his uh, lecture Thank you. Yeah, Assalamualaikum and very good morning. Uh, thank you for, for the very kind introduction. Thank you. So, uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank the organizing committee, uh, especially to Dr. Hafiza, Dr. Nafina for inviting me today. Um, so, I'll be talking on uh, evaluating aspects for in acute estimate stroke setting. Uh, I understand the majority of atten uh, attendees are from the majority of attendees today are from the uh, medical officer uh, of the department pool. So I'll try to touch a bit uh, on basic of CT scan as well as um, some terminologies in radiology um, in, in CT CT um, acute stroke reporting and also. I'd also like to touch on the anatomy, uh, especially pertaining to uh, acute ischemic stroke. Then later on, we'll dive in straight into the aspect scoring for anterior and postulation. Okay, so the overview of my talk today is uh, these are the overview, some terminologies, some basic terminologies, CT scan. So, as uh, I hope that you can actually speak the same language. Uh, so, I mean, the report, um, my report, and then also your understanding are the same. And then a bit on basic anatomy uh, pertaining to stroke. And then subsequently, we'll talk a bit on stroke and uh, for acute uh, posterior and uh, anterior and posterior situation. And lastly, on aspect scoring. Okay. Um, so, terminologies. So, first of all, I think uh, most of the hospital in Malaysia, we are, we are not blessed to have a computerized system yet. So, most of the time, you are, you are practicing by using just films. We don't have uh you don't have that pack system in order for you to view to view all the whole set of CT scan uh on computer. So if you're provided with CT scan, you will you will have this type of images. So I just want to make sure that you know uh I think everyone knows that the lesion, if you haven't got a lesion here, for example, uh, which is on your left hand side, but it's actually on the right, the right side of the patient. Um and then similarly on when there's a lesion on the contralateral side, that's the albeta. Uh, left side of the patient, although it's on your right right hand side, and then for um 
in order to describe an anatomy or pathology or a structure. So we use all this uh, terminology, hypodense, isodense, and hypodense. So similarly for, for ultrasound, we use hypoechoic, isoechoic, and hypoechoic. So all, it all depends on what modality that we use. So hypodense is a uh, dense density is basically looking at the so when you have an anatomy, when you have a structure, then you have you actually this you actually are describing it in relation to uh one particular structure. So for city brain, we are looking for uh the gray matter. So anything that is uh darker than the gray matter, so we call it hypodense. Anything that is similar to the gray matter, we call it isodense. Anything that high a hyperdense is basically it's brighter than the gray matter. Okay. And then sections. So like I said, if you are if you're practicing by just using films, uh so you'll be provided with just Excel section. You don't you don't have the luxury to, to view it on coronal or surgical section. Um uh, some hospital, like I said, so like Trajaya or uh Sungai Bulo, so you are provided with film. I mean we provided with the raw data then actually actually can view it on the other sections as well. Okay, so we are done with the some uh, basic terminologies for CT scan. Then we we'll move on next to the uh, basic anatomy. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, so in order to understand how do we view, how do we diagnose a stroke, we have to understand the presence of gray and white matter in the brain. So, the majority of uh, the uh, gray matter, they are all external, outside, uh, along the cortices. And then the majority of the white matter they are all, uh, they are in the um internal internal to the uh internal to the gray matter. So as you can see here, although the name is um gray matter is repeat. So although the name is uh white matter is basically it's uh it appears darker on CT scan, and then gray matter appears brighter than the gray matter uh, than the white matter. So this is just a schematic diagram showing you the locations of gray matter. So as you can see, the white matter it doesn't it doesn't go all the way until the end of the uh, uh, brain surface. Okay, so this is important in order to to know which one uh, whether that's a stroke or it's just a normal anatomy structure. Okay. Um. Next one is I'm just gonna show you the level of uh, basal ganglia. So although um, so why do we need to know this is because in order to understand in order to give an aspect score you have to understand the anatomy okay so first is uh at the level of basic ganglia so you're looking at the uh ventricles here uh this particular the morphology of the ventricles is at this uh, point so you can see this is the caudal nucleus which is the head of the caudal nucleus and then we have a dark band here which is the internal capsule so the caudal nucleus and internal capsule they are part of aspect scoring and then Further lateral to the um, internal capsule, then you start seeing the lentiform nucleus, also part of uh, part of uh, aspect scoring. And then here you can see this structure here. This is basically the insula, also part of uh, aspect scoring. Okay, so so this is uh, anatomy based for aspect scoring. I'll show you. So we're gonna go through this later on again. Just gonna uh, try to uh, correlate the purpose of learning the anatomy and uh, then because this is important for the scoring later on so you can see here i shown you earlier how the nucleus which is part of gray matter if it's brighter than the white matter internal capsule just lateral to it is the internal capsule and further lateral is the lentiform nucleus and the insular region then we've got this some cortical uh cortical scoring uh, i'll discuss uh, that later okay and then um Insula is basically uh, is one of the structures that is commonly looked at in order to find a very subtle change in stroke. So insula is basically a brain structure that is hidden. So this is insula. If you remove this, uh, if you remove this surgical, surgical uh, instrument, we basically the insula will basically be covered uh, by this brain structure. So this is the insula, and then um. Uh, you have you are the insula is covered by the frontal loop, what we call as frontal operculum, or in also covered by the parietal loop, or part of parietal operculum, and then covered by temporal loop, the temporal operculum. Okay, 
And then uh, next is Corona Radiata. So I, I, I'm sure that uh, during your reading radiology report, you can actually, you, you have encountered this terminology of Corona Radiata. So Corona Radiata is basically white matter at the level of uh, the ventricle. So when you see white matter along the level of the ventricle, be above the basal ganglia level, so that's basically the corona radiata. And then when you scroll further up or, when you, or you view the uh, images further up, then you start seeing an also white matter. So that's what we call as centrum semiovale. So normally when there is a uh, lacuna infarction, so there's infarct, so, you, so let's say we describe there is lacuna infarct in the right corona radiata. So this, this is the structure that we are referring to. So, so we are done with uh, anatomy of the supratentorial brain. So meaning supratentorial is anything that's above the tentorium. So uh, so now we are going to look at the uh, basic anatomy of the infratentorial brain. So infratentorial brain is uh, it includes the brainstem uh, and also the cerebellum. So the first structure that you encounter when you scroll down into the level of uh, just below the, uh, the tentorium is the midbrain. So midbrain uh, has got this uh, two bridges. So this is the connector between the uh, supratentorial brain and infratentorial brain, each year, what we call as cerebellar, cerebral peduncles. So we've got a pair, of, a pair of them. And then the midbrain, and also we have a, a superior cerebellar peduncle, which is a connection between the midbrain and the cerebellum. This is the cerebellum uh, posteriorly. And then if you go down a little bit down, then you start seeing the enlarged. Um, structure here, this is basically the pons. The common side of uh, hemorrhage, for hypertensive hemorrhage, common side of infarct. And then we have the bridge between the pons to the cerebellum, which is the middle cerebellar peduncles. So this is an uncommon side for stroke. Uh, so if you've got a lesion here, you have to consider other other pathology before, I mean, before putting a stroke as one of your main uh, top differential. And then we have got the cerebellum. And then as we scroll further down, then we start seeing the medulla oblongata. At this particular region, then you start to see all this, uh, what we call as a uh, beam hardening artifacts. So basically it's artifacts. So because of very dense structure bone here, normally the X-ray will be absorbed by the bone. And then so they'll be deficient of uh, X-ray photon here, causing it becomes dark. So that's normally confusing. So it's kind of, it's kind of difficult to diagnose stroke here, especially in the uh, medulla oblongata. Okay, and then uh, next is anatomy on vascular territories. So uh, we have we have got two articulations, the anterior and posterior, and then this is the schematic diagram of a, a, a conventional um, circle of Willis. So what I say conventional is this is what we normally learn uh, from textbook, but sometimes we have deficient one vessel, sometimes you don't have one, three vessels. So, but this is what the, the normal, I mean, the whole circle should look like. Should, okay. So, first is we have got the internal. So, uh, the division between anterior and posterior circulation is this demarcation here. So, anything that's beyond this line is the anterior circulation. So, you've got the internal carotid arteries, bilateral which subsequently divides into the uh, middle cerebral artery, which is uh, our main concern on uh, aspect scoring for today. And then we have, we have anterior cerebral artery. So the anterior, um, the anterior and I mean the, the right and left anterior cerebral artery is connected by a bridge called anterior communicating artery. So God has created it to, I mean, to help each other. So we, if we have got some problem here, the other vessel will come and help. And then so yeah so that's the whole anterior circulations and now the posterior circulation is uh, coming from the vertebral artery right and left which converge and to form basilar artery and then this will divide into the posterior cerebellar artery so along the way we have got branches uh, but yes sometimes they are sometimes they are there sometimes they are uh, hydroplastic but these are the common vessels that we are looking for and then what connects uh, the anterior and posterior circulation uh, is the posterior communicating artery. Okay, so this this works as a whole circle. So which whichever vessel 
if if one vessel fails, the other will uh be activated and come and help the the brain until it's really un um it's it's really like beyond help that then uh the brain will proceed with uh uh established infarction. Okay, so for 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 stroke, it tends to no, it tends it all it always follows follow the uh vasculatory thing. So sometimes when you have a stroke mimickers, uh the thing that helps us is by knowing where are the vascular territories. So when the lesion involves different territories, so they are most likely not stroke, but uh, because they, a stroke will always confine, um, I mean, arterial stroke will always confine to their territories. It doesn't go and cross beyond their territories. Okay. So anything which is supratentorial, meaning the brain, which are so supratentorial, they are mostly anterior circulation, except for the uh, occipital loop and also part of the temporal loop here and then all the structures in the uh, posterior I mean, in the infratentorial brain are from the anterior circulation and sorry posterior circulation okay so now uh, we come to the uh, our main topic which is on ischemic stroke so they are acute subacute and chronic but some sometimes we divide it acute we have got hyperacute early hyperacute late hyperacute and then acute but so basically for the for for the purpose of simplicity i'm just gonna uh clump it together in acute subacute and chronic okay so stroke is uh is major cause of mortality and morbidity uh worldwide and then is the third most common cause of mortality in malaysia after heart disease and pneumonia and then uh, ischemic stroke being the most common uh, and then uh, hypertension is the most common risk factor followed by diabetes mellitus. Uh, so ischemic stroke is more common as compared to the uh, hemorrhagic stroke. It accounts up to 80% of the cases and these are the uh, common causes which, are, which can be thrombosis from the atherosclerotic disease of the large vessel or intra intracranial small uh, vessel disease and embolism from elsewhere. So the MOH has recommended that CT brain is mandat mandatory and also uh, the preferred imaging uh, for in acute, acute, acute stroke setting. Firstly, is to differentiate uh, whether it's a hemorrhagic stroke or ischemic stroke. And then we look at the site and then the extent of the uh, stroke involvement. Mm -hmm. So I've mentioned earlier, early, late, acute. So basically, acute stroke, stroke will fall under the... Uh, less than seven days. And beyond that is up to three weeks is subacute and chronic is more than three weeks. Right. So for acute infarct, what do you expect to see? An established infarct, so you expect to see hypodensity. So hypodensity, first we have, we have learned the term hypodensity, meaning it's darker than compared to the gray matter. So we, we are looking for hypodensity, hypodense area which respect the vascular territory. So it doesn't go beyond its territory. So meaning if there is middle cerebral artery occlusion, the involvement will only confine to the middle cerebral artery. It doesn't go beyond beyond that. Okay, so for example, uh, this one case here, we have hypodensity, hypodense area uh, involving the um, insula, frontal lobe, and then anterior temporal lobe uh, here. So, most of the time, it will we will have a, like a, a broad based broad based uh um broad based involvement like a wedge shape, so that's how it's normally uh, the stroke will normally appear. So the base is to the skull is larger compared to the to the uh, ventricle. Okay, so that is the typical established infarct appearance, but sometimes in a uh acute stroke also can present with a normal totally normal uh brain findings so you cannot see, you cannot find anything any abnormality uh especially in a hyper acute state and then sometimes they can just be small infarct uh, and then you can see sometimes we describe as loss absence of basal ganglia so we have an infarct here hypodensity on the left side it involves the caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus so instead of saying seeing hyper so we take this as a comparison so in, instead of seeing hyperdensity in the caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus, we are seeing hyperdensity uh, involving the 
gray matter. So this structure should actually be be hyperdense, but they they appear to be hypodense. So this is a stroke in the left basal ganglia. And sometimes uh we have come across a term of loss of insular ribbons. So when there is stroke, there will be edema. So edema will actually cause uh, some mass effect. So uh, the insula will have this undulating margin, what we normally describe as a ribbon, ribboning of the insula. So when there is actually infarct in that region, it will cause effacement, effacement of the ribboning. So we have to start to see loss of that undulating margin. It's become, it becomes like a, a chubby structure rather than like a curvy structure. Okay, so apart from seeing hypodensity, we also can actually tell the presence of uh, thrombus by looking at the density density of the vessel. So for example, here in the right M M1 MCA, we are seeing there's hypodensity when we compare it to the contralateral side. It actually appears brighter, whiter com compared to the, the contralateral side. This is because of thrombus. So thrombus just like hemorrhage in the brain, like a okay, hemorrhage will appear dense, it will appear bright. The thrombus will appear similarly in the within the vessel. So this is a uh, dense right MCS sign. So sometimes if, if, you, if you follow the vessel, you can actually see also dense vessel beyond the M1. This is M1 segment. This is M2 segment. So M2 segment is also bright in this particular case. You have density here uh, indicating a thrombus. And then sometimes you can have even a calcified thrombus, meaning you have got like a calcification in the bulk. It is it ruptures yeah. and then it, it just extends, it, it's dislodged. Okay. So um this is just to show you the different appearances of stroke with different uh ages. So a patient with headache and left sided neglect. So when you have got like a left sided lesion, so you try to look at the right side of the brain. So this is the first scan when patient present acutely. You can see loss of uh, the gray matter here along the cortices is lost. So this is what we call as absence of uh, or poor gray white matter differentiation. So you, you don't really see the difference. Uh, you, you can't really differentiate with the, with the gray matter and the white matter because of the presence of stroke. And then in the subacute, subacute phase, the stroke becoming more hypodense, more conspicuous. And then you can actually see it. You don't have to like change the window. You don't have to like scrutinize, screen your eyes to actually see it, but you can actually see the abnormality here. And then in the chronic phase, now the whole brain uh, is already infected and it becomes necrotic. And then you have, it has got gliosis surrounding it. Then because of, uh, because of volume loss in that particular area, it starts to become uh, uh, it starts to pull the ventricle to become bigger. So this is what we normally call as ex vacuo dilatation of the ventricle. It's because of absence of brain structure here, absence of uh, brain volume here, it causing a uh, negative mass effect. Okay, so uh, next is on lacuna infarct. So lacuna infarct is basically uh, infarct, which is, uh, uh, which is just a small uh, on, on CT scan. So the size is normally one to two centimeters, or most of the time it's less than two, two centimeters. So uh, when you, you've got stroke here, for example here, this is if you measure probably like uh, two cm, one, one by two cm. So this is all uh, lacuna infarction in the basal ganglia. Okay, so now we, we, we come to our main topic, which is on aspect scoring. So aspect score stands for Alberta Alberta Stroke Program Early CT Score. So uh, I'm sure we've discussed we'll discuss on anatomy of the basal ganglia. So how do we how do we remember how do we remember this is by looking at the uh the uh the four structure in the basal ganglia. So first is to assess basal ganglia level and then subsequently we go and assess the coronary data level or beyond the central summit of Ali. So in the basic ganglia level, we are looking at the four uh, structures I've shown you earlier, the cardiac nucleus, internal capsule, lentiform nucleus, and the insula. So I used, when I, when I first started, I, I, I was having difficulty in remembering, the, remembering them. So I made up uh, uh, my own uh, mnemonic, but this is like a very amateur kind of mnemonic, but 
uh, it, it helps me, so I'm not sure whether you can apply it. So I use the mnemonic of CLIC, C L I, sorry, C L I I C. So it's like CLIC. So there's those those are the four structures: the caudate nucleus, the lentiform nucleus, internal capsule, and insula. And then at this particular level, also you try to have a look at the cortices. So you divide it into the frontal, the frontal uh lobe, which is uh we call it frontal operculum, the one that I've shown you earlier. Uh, and then the temporal anterior temporal lobe and the posterior temporal lobe. So at this particular level, so you have got like a, a seven points. So basically, aspect scoring is you you are giving the patient ten points. So whenever there's involvement on the CT scan, you just minus one point. You have to deduct one point. So for example, at basically ganglia level, there is involvement of the insula. There's involvement of the lentiform. So you have to minus. Two, so the aspect score for the patient would be eight, okay. And then if you go a little bit up to coronary radiata and central semi semi ovale level, so you have another three points, uh, which is M four, M five, and M six. M four is basically just direct superior, so you don't have to remember the the exact anatomy, so you can just call it the involvement of M four, the involvement of M five. So M four is basically anything that is above the M one, uh, and M two is M five is anything beyond above the M2 and M6 is anything that's above the M3. So you sort of like eyeball it, the involvement, and then you can just tell, okay, there's involvement of this particular structure. So you have to see evidence, you have to see hypodensity in order to deduct the point. So total of 10 points and involvement minus one point. Well, this is just for uh, MCA stroke. Okay, so why do we use aspect scores? So aspect, score, aspect scoring, I think, has uh, it has been established that it has got good correlation with the clinical presentation, with the uh, possible outcome of the patient, and then uh, the treatment of the patient, and also uh, in the long in the long run, it has got uh, uh, inverse relationship with the cognitive dysfunction. These are all, uh, I mean, it has been established. It's well known that aspect scoring is. Uh, could have this relationship with all these uh, clinical biomarkers. So, so when you're presented with a CT scan, so you ha you have assessed the patient, you have sent the patient, you send the patient to uh CT suite, and then CT is performed, and then if you uh then you are provided with the film or you provided with a with a with a soft uh soft copy uh film, then you are basically you are reviewing the non contrast CT brain. And then after that, you perform qualitative assessment. So the majority of people will perform qualitative aspect scoring. So basically, you just uh, look look at yourself, like eyeballing it. Then you give them scoring. And then uh, sometimes, if you're lucky, you can have like a quantitative, quantitative aspect scoring. So quantitative aspect scoring is basically you've got the machine to do it for you. But I think you have to rely more on your uh, visual assessment. So we're not that lucky to have... Uh, all centers to have this quantitative uh, scoring, and then uh, and even though even though you you have but uh, the 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 program is always I mean the software is is not uh well established is it's not um well universally accepted, okay. So after performing that, uh, it is highly recommended to have a CTA and CT brain to uh as part of your CT protocol to assess in, in acute ischemic stroke setting. So non-contrast CT brain and also CTA should always be, should always come together. And then if you have the luxury of performing CT perfusion, that's even better. You can actually look at the uh, uh, look at the uh, performance of the brain tissue uh, in uh, after facing this uh, uh, sudden occlusion of vessel. So that, that's going to be like a very huge topic uh, but now we just focus on the non contrast CT head. Okay, so I've got some cases to show you, and uh, in order to for, for for you to further understand, uh, how do we score the patient for aspect scoring? So, <clears throat> this patient is sixty eight year old, left sided body weakness, onset five hours prior to CT. So this is basically beyond the conventional uh conventional uh thrombolysis hour. So we're taking as four point five hours. So first is we assess at the basic ganglia level, then try to look at the because left side of the body weakness, try to look on the right side, look at the um 
recorded nucleus, internal capsule, lentiform nucleus, insular region. So we do not really see any uh, any hypodensity. Nothing also in the M1, M2, and M3 region. Okay. And then if we go up further in the coronary radiata or central semi ovarian level, then we start seeing this hypodensity here, probably in the uh, M4, M4 region. This is M5 and this is M6. So you, you are losing the gray white matter differentiation. So this is this patient is, if I were to give that scoring is probably like nine over ten, uh, and then we we in HKL we have the uh, luxury of uh, performing uh, scoring. Uh, I mean uh, qualitative scoring, but for this particular region is they give the aspect score of nine, same like mine, but they are the the calculation is at the M three region. So I try to look, I try to adjust. I can't, I couldn't really see the hypodensity in the M2 region. Yeah. So sometimes uh you I mean you're not in not in agreement with the the, the automatic calculation, especially if it's not uh, a software that is well established. So I think you just have to uh, assess it more then you have just have to follow your qualitative assessment. And then we performed a CTA for this patient. So the in the pre-contrast you can actually see hypodensity here. If you compare it to the other side, it's like okay, more or less more hyperdense. Probably retrospectively, you can actually say okay, this is slightly hyperdense. And then when we perform CTA, there's actually occlusion from the distal M1 extending to the proximal M uh, M2. So this is uh, a, a typical case of a acute ischemic stroke. And then this patient will benefit from treatment with the aspect scoring of uh, a nine. And the second case is a 73 year old left sided body weakness also. Uh, so try to focus on the right uh, brain. So first is we try to have a look at the body nucleus, looks okay. Internal, nucle internal nucleus, uh, internal capsule looks okay. Empty form looks fine. And then we move a bit further lateral and we start seeing hypodensity in the insula region. We compare it to the contralateral side. And then we have the um, M1 also involved at M2 as well. So this is roughly about seven. At this level, we are minus three. If we go up, the M4 is also involved. So this is like a, a six, so score of six. So, uh, so this patient we performed, uh, uh, we tried to adjust in the coronal section, try to look at the, the dense vessel here. So you have got this dense vessel. And then true enough, if compare it, here we can't really see the dense vessel. And then true enough, if we perform CTA, you can you can see CTA, the occlusion in this region. Okay. Um, and then case number three is 82 year old dense left hemoparesis. So we see hypodensity in the uh probably the M1, uh also uh M2 and insula. So another one is here in the uh M5 region, so it's like a six for a six or probably seven. Uh, you have to look nice the whether the 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 M2 is really involved or not. So this is at least seven out of ten. So you have minus three points. Even if you keep seeing the sections all the way up, it's all it's all it's also it's just one point because it's the level of M4. And at the same time, you can actually see the dense vessel, uh, indicating thrombosis in the uh, M2 MCA. So done with the and uh, aspect for for interest circulation for the medial cerebral artery. So next is the posterior circulation aspect scoring. So to be honest, we I haven't actually used this uh uh in HKL or even when I was below in 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 Australia. I mean they, they don't really use this uh, posterior circulation aspect scoring. Uh, but uh for the purpose of completeness for today, so you just have to. Have a look because sometimes you know people mention okay what's about the post posterior sequence aspect score so you have to um also mention about it uh, although you not you, you don't really use it um clinically so just like anterior anterior circulation i mean mca aspect scoring so for posterior circulation is we've got we we give the patient 10 points and then we minus uh each involvement each hypodensity in the region we minus uh one or two points Okay, for thalamus, so you've got right and left thalamus. Because posterior circulation will involve, it can involve bilateral compared to the anterior circulation. Anterior circulation is either uh, right or left. 
um, if you have like a right MCA, so the, the abnormality will be on the right side only. But for posterior circulation, uh, if you have got, a, because it comes from a common origin of vessel, whereby the vertebral artery converge and become basilar. So any thrombus, you can actually go to the to both sides. Okay, so uh, thalamus, improvement of thalamus, one, thalam one thalamus is one point, and then two thalami is two points. So you have to minus two points. Similarly, for occipital lobe, one occipital lobe involvement is one point, two is two points. But for midbrain, it, it carries a heavier weight. Uh, we buy we the other thing, midbrain involvement, straight away minus two points. And then similarly for pawns, any involvement, even if it's like right hemipons, left hemipons, regardless, you have to minus one, two points. And the cerebellum, uh, despite its large size, one, one involvement is one point, two involvement, I mean, both the other side involvement is two points. So total of 10 points for focus question. So, so it also has been shown that if, uh, the, the lower the uh, uh, aspect score for process circulation is uh, the unfavorable the outcome is going to be. So uh, similarly, we take part of seven for process circulation aspect scoring uh, to actually decide which patient is, will have a favorable or unfavorable outcome. Okay, so this is an example of a post circulation stroke. 59 year old lady uh, with headache, was needing right side body weakness. And then when we perform CT scan, you actually see there is um, hypodensity in the superior cerebellum. So this would be in the superior cerebellar artery uh, territory. And further down, we've got another one more here. But it's all in the same side, left cerebellum. So it's just uh, one point minus. Nothing convincing in the uh, visualized membrane point. Uh, and so for the points here, nothing is convincing to minus two. So it's a total of aspect scoring, posterior, posterior, posterior aspect scoring of nine out of ten. And then case number two is a uh, 38 year old uh, gentleman with acute vertigo, infl uh, recent infl influenza infection, uh, mild ataxia, and then um, you want to rule out CBA. So we see there is involvement of the uh, posterior inferior cerebellar artery uh, 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 infarction, so the pica, pica territory. So only at this one side. There's not, nothing else in the left side, nothing in the occipital loop, nothing in the visual brain, also nothing in the occipital loop. So this is also a uh, posterior circulation scoring of uh, nine. Yeah, so yeah, I think that's, that's all for me. Um, if you've got any question, then uh, we can discuss them together. If not, then yeah, thank you. Um, okay, we open for any question. Uh, anybody can uh, ask a question directly or you can type in the meeting chat. Hi, hi Rudy, Nasrina here. Hi, hi. Hello, Soalan. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask, how sensitive is the aspect score evaluation of plain CT brain as compared to the MRI? Um, the reason I'm asking is because I recently had a patient, uh, elderly patient, who came in with large vessel obstruction over the left MCA. Uh, from the time that this patient uh, received thrombolytic therapy and proceeded with MRI, um, compared, I mean, uh, if you take the, the time of the onset, uh, of, sorry, the time of the first CT brain, uh, non-contrasted CT brain being performed for this patient until the patient went to HPUPM for thrombolytic therapy and also thrombectomy, um, is about less than one hour. The first CT brain showed the um, uh, aspect score at least more eight and above, but the MRI, which was performed later on in HPUPM, showed the aspect score was only one. So uh, patient was thrombolyzed based on the CT brain that we performed in Putrajaya Hospital, and patient developed a bit of complication. She had an intracranial bleeding. So I uh, was just wondering, um, do you have any comment on that? How many hours from one set? Sorry, catch out. <laughs> I know you will come in. Um, um, it was about like one one and a half hours from the onset. From onset, okay. Yes, okay, yes. I'll let Hyodin comment. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, so 
the, the time from the cities. So after so you thrombolyzed after the first aspect scoring of eight, and then after that it's uh after that went for for MRI, uh aspect score was already one. Yes, yes. I, I think they, they, they started the because we normally what we'll do is we'll send the um city brain for them and uh, I think upon assessment mm. they decided to thrombolyze and proceeded with the MRI straight away. But in detail I'm not very sure, but we managed to send the patient uh less than one hour to HP UPM. So I'm I'm not really sure what, what how how the aspect scoring was perform probably just patient that it doesn't have enough collateral to actually to 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 help with the brain. Uh because some I mean collateral uh collaterals depend uh, mostly on individual rather than something that's fixed. So mm -hmm. if you have got like a more uh, more risk factor, vascular risk factor then you your collaterals won't work as as perfectly as people who does who doesn't have. So yeah I think that's just um because it's always most of the time is it will always be tell it your as as long as you score it perfect I mean score it perfectly so I can't really comment on how the effort scoring was was made. Hmm. Oh, okay. So so there can be quite a discrepancy even though the time, I mean, uh, if let's say we have a neurologist in Putrajaya, um, probably mm. it will be a bit different. But uh, because the MRI was performed later, so um, yeah, we're just wondering, um, would uh, doing another MRI before thrombolysis would be a better option for this patient? But I'm sure for the neurologist, they would like to proceed with the thrombolytic therapy. So it's a bit of a difficult case, I suppose. Um, yeah. Uh, can I just have to do MRI? MRI? Yeah. So sorry, sorry. You you're saying something. You you first. I mean, yeah. to, to do MRI um for I think it's gonna delay. One thing is gonna delay the uh I think the ma the major issue is we don't have the luxury to perform MRI for all patients. That's mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And then uh secondly, I think it's gonna delay the 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 whole process because of uh MRI is I mean scanning is not that long. It's just that transferring and then getting the consent, make sure patient doesn't have all the risk factors. Uh, for and all the metals, so that's gonna take that's gonna take time. Um, so, uh, I I agree. Not... I, I support you for for that basically with <laughs> existence of Hyrudin, a uh, few of uh, the other colleagues that are to uh fast enough to interpret scan, uh, plane scan nicely, CTA nicely, uh, yeah, MRI for hyperacute is very much uh called. This is for service, yeah. Not for research. For research, different. Uh, for service is very much uh, uh, called wasting wasting the neurons. So the neurons are going to be yeah uh, destroyed because of the time delay. So I I suppose yeah that's not the way to go. Um, I just I I don't want a bit. Uh, stroke is not a static thing. So stroke uh, as well what we mentioned. So for example. The one, uh, the for every single minute, two million neuron uh, died. So o obviously, we know that that's not the same thing. I already mentioned accurately just now. Uh, collaterals change things. Sounds like the patient that being discussed is actually a, a thrombus patient. So if you have a thrombogenic patient, uh, the 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 two millions might be valid because of the collaterals is very very much poor poor, and the risk of bleeding is high. So uh, what we do is basically. If the scan already like 60 minutes or 90 minutes, we don't use your, your scan from your primary arrival. So that's the reason why I always tell it's not feasible for you just to plan for transfer thrombectomy. It's always, if possible, you start thrombolysis in your center, not at uh, called transfer then baru buat, if possible. Even with my uh, spoke hospital, that is the future plan. I don't want to, to manage thrombolysis uh, from in our ED. The best is, from the IED, um, that's one thing. So, but we do via via remote teleconsult. Uh, if the the usually the the easiest way is the clinical NIHS, so the NIST score. So, if the NIST score increased by four, unfortunately, we need to disturb uh, the radiologist. I we need to have another scan because of we want to exclude there's a hemorrhagic transformation. It's rare, uh, we know, but the thing is, uh, then you decide on what is the next step. This is the, the unfortunate part of thrombectomy. Majority of the things you, if you see, I think case number three, I heard in just now, 
So uh, you didn't mention the, the onset, but you see majority, the fast progressor with poor collaterals, the hypodensity is there. No, not for thrombectomy. So if you open up, you cause more massive bleeding. The patient now is for cranectomy. So mm. something like that. So that's, that's how we deal with stroke. It's very, very dynamic. So it's not just static. So in a way, in this case, um, well, how do we know this patient has poor collateral? Is there any way of knowing it? But I'm sure Plain CT wouldn't be able to tell much. From, um, perhaps MRI. Yeah, from our CTA is, uh, we can actually see the vessels, the vessels, um, the distal vessels, um, the number of the vessels. We've got the scoring for that. Uh, but it's a bit complicated, but we don't really use it. So mostly, uh, we used to we used to to score the collaterals, but uh, clinicians don't really rely on that. So we stopped doing that anymore. Um, so we just rough. We see all, all this more collateral, less collateral. So basically, we compare it to the contralateral brain. Uh, so yeah, it's just looking at the uh, another another thing is by doing perfusion. Perfusion is basically another layer of information, putting another layer of information, saying that okay, this patient has got good collaterals. That's why the the perfusion is is has got like a less call and more penumbra. So that's that's another indirect way of looking at the uh, collaterals. I see. Um, okay, I got a second question. Sorry for asking a lot of questions. <laughs> oh, okay. I would like to know how sensitive is a non-contrasted CT brain in picking up lacuna stroke? Because I've had, I've had a few cases of whereby they couldn't see. Patient has uh, suggestive mm. symptoms of stroke. We treated as stroke. Uh, but uh, because the CT was reported as unable to see any stroke, uh, so the patient was not treated as stroke, which I think uh, is a bit unfair for the patient. So, um, yeah, I would like to know what is your comment regarding that? Um, yeah, percentage-wise, I'm not really sure how sensitive it is, but uh, it's actually very difficult to, 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 to look at lacuna stroke. If you have got like a big one, like what I've shown earlier, like, probably two centimeters then you can actually see it but uh if it's not then um then yeah bro, it's, it's it's the stroke that you normally can miss because uh just just bringing in my experience from from uh from birth so what we no normally do for patient with stroke is we perform ct scan we, we do cta and then that patient will have an inpatient mri so mm -hmm. so we're seeing so many lacuna impacts that we miss Okay. And then it's like, okay, oh, this is like, in fact, oh, actually we missed it. Retrospectively, if we adjust the contrast, then probably we can see it. And then another confounding issue is in Malaysia, we've got like so many patients with uh, severe small vessel disease. So when you have got a acute stroke in the area of that small vessel disease, small vessel disease is basically the white matter become more hypodense, more dark. So mm -hmm. that's very common that we comment, oh, they're periventricular hypodensity in keeping with small vessel ischemia or small vessel disease. So that will further reduce the sensitivity of the CT scan to pick up lacuna impacts because it's only dark. Then you try to detect another dark area, so it's 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 it's, it's, it's difficult. And uh, personally, I think it's 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 commonly missed. Uh, from what I see from CT scan and also subsequently MRI, what we did in in first, you can actually see the the difference now. But if you have got a big one and then you've got further uh, support by your CT perfusion. Then that actually can can increase your sensitivity. The CT perfusion I think is very helpful because sometimes we can see small ones, especially in the basal ganglia, like thalamus, uh, cerebellum. So yeah, I think I think that that, that that's just a solution that we can we can provide. Mm, thank you. I just add on. I think uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I think uh, is uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Basically, uh, most of part of Australia is perfusion and hyperacute, CT perfusion and hyperacute. And um, as they try as much as possible early, uh, meaning when you don't do more thrombectomy, you don't want to do uh, thrombolysis, you don't want to cranectomy, uh, optimal medical therapy already been given, but they want to know the diagnosis, then that's MRI coming in. Really, really good. I also do that uh, in, in my practice. And now it's actually mostly, uh, if possible, in the UKM side, and uh, majority of the private side, I use it for subacute. That's how we use it uh, in Australia. Correct me if I'm wrong, Harudin, do you agree? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you do, you do an MRI inpatient. How about MRI one month later for stroke? 
<laughs> so you're gonna you're gonna be seeing just the chronic <laughs> infection. So uh sometimes if let's say if you if you have like a prior imaging, then you can see oh there is an interval infarct. So meaning your brain CT brain is normal. Then one month later, uh oh there's now a new infarct. But if you have, like if you if you don't have like a uh like for us in HKL, we don't have PET system. So you actually you you are scanning patient fresh both time both times. You know like play. I mean when you do CT scan, okay still first time. MRI is first time. So you're not really seeing the connection. But mm -hmm. if you have got like a prior CT and after the MRI, then it, oh, you compare, oh, there's actually now a hole in that region, which was used to be a normal area. So you can actually see there's an interval interval change and there's like a uh, 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 an infarct going on in between these two scans. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is because I've been seeing, especially for the posterior circulation stroke, MRI in two months' time. Not sure what they wanted to see. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I think it is a waste of uh, resources, I suppose. You can't really tell yeah, yeah. it, okay, right? Mm, okay. It's, it's because it's just you want to see the the end the end result, and people are not no longer interested by them. People are like, oh, okay, you know, but. If you have, if you are, if you are able to perform it within that particular, within that particular admission, then that would be, that that would be good, uh yeah. But because for for us in HKL, the last the MRI is just to look at the burden of the stroke by then, because our MRI is like very late. We can't we, because we can't really cope. But posterior circulation, yeah, we do inpatient. We try to do inpatient if there is a suspicion, but for anterior circulation, not so much now. So for MRI inpatient, what is the advice? Uh, you want to see the, the, the progression or you want to see whether the, the one that you miss for like the lacuna infarcts, right? The recommended timing would be like maybe 24, 48 hours? So for, for posterior circulation, we try to do it, uh, like let's say the request comes in today. So we try to do it tomorrow or the day after. So mm -hmm. it's like just a few days because it's going to be a very short sequence. We don't we do not do that much for, for oh. acute uh, stroke setting. Um. But uh, for anterior secretion, no, anterior secretion is going to be outpatient. That's just, just, that's just uh, bad. But yeah, we can't really cope for anterior secretion. It's a lot. I mean, do you do you mean that now you can also change the practice now in your center in Malaysia, doing the yeah. the, the Australia style, the limited stroke sequence? Are are you doing that? Yeah, yeah, we we are yeah we're trying to we try to do that like very very and fast. And then for acute setting, sometimes I just do two sequence. Just flare and just flare and DW at ADC and then yeah because we've already, we've got the vessel vessel luminal imaging by doing CTA so we don't need to repeat MRA anymore so yeah we we can actually save so much time patient yes. will come out in like five minutes it's just that the preparation is a bit long it's actually a preparation is longer than the than scan no because uh not enough time for the patient to to feel claustrophobic yeah yeah it's too short. Hmm, interesting. Thank you. Um, ada one question nak tanya. I think uh, apa, uh, just uh, nak ask regarding apa, um, CTA for the last weekend ocean. Is it um, for us kau macam uh, more to advise uh, to do CTA for last weekend ocean because uh, because patient with the last weekend ocean like uh, their hypertension, MCA, infarct, they are highest of bleeding if we thrombolize. Uh, just now, uh, Dr. Ashraf uh, said that um, if you want to delay um, apa, the reperfusion, uh, if you want to send to trombet, uh, the trombo, uh, trombectomy punya center, so uh, is it um, it will suggest that we perform the CTA for all last vessel operation before we decide for thrombolysis? Okay, so um, I think, uh, I think well, Dr. Ashraf... Large vessel occlusion, I think it's... it's yes. uh, if in acute setting, it's acute stroke yes. setting. It's recommended to have a to have a CTA together with your CT, CT brain. Uh, last time the recommendation comes in just for patient with uh just if the hospital has um come back to me service. But now if you have thrombolysis, if you want to treat the patient, although without come back to me, I think it's good to have a CTA. Uh, one thing is it it further increase your confidence in diagnosing there is large vessel occlude uh, occlusion. Um, rather than just seeing at the uh, plain scan, so just like uh, Nasina's case, whereby you don't have, let's say, you don't have further support that saying, okay, there is a large vessel 
solution, but just plain scan. So I think to do CTA is good, even without, even you don't have that thrombectomy service at your center. Um, uh, I think that, that, that's very helpful. CT perfusion is, it can be plus, uh, plus minus, uh, but I think CTA and CT, I mean, uh, non-contrast and CTA should come together for a good uh, STB strong setting. I totally agree with Harudin and I just maybe share because of uh, fortunately or unfortunately uh, when I joined Neuro and Stroke is the time where thrombectomy uh, was approved in 2015. Um, the protocol is basically scan plane, no ICH, uh, then uh, call, you feel there's a good candidate then uh, you thrombolyze first if they're within time, then you reassess after completion of thrombolysis. Then you go for CTA. That is the old protocol. So when I then sit down with my colleague in 2016, then I say, you always tell us time is brain, but what you're doing is not time is brain because of you wait for the thrombolysis to work. And true enough, after about six months later, then uh, the all the, the stroke neurologists interventionally sit down. So basically, just to share with you, because I, I have seen a few centers still doing CTA after one hour assessment. We don't do that anymore since 2016 uh, in any other part of the developed world. Uh, so basically, we do CTA uh, at the moment of uh, we uh, we trom uh, call, we, we assess them. Um, some, uh, some centers, if they are able to do fast, for example, in our center, what we do is I do a CT plane scan. If they are within hyperacute, I'll just thrombolize this patient with the CT plane before the CTA. Uh, yang itu pun nanti you have a different finding because of if the clot is too small, don't change your, your diagnosis to not a stroke because of then the whole thing will recanalize. You have a patient which is dense. Suddenly after CT perfusion, everything is good. So, uh, so basically that can happen. So although there's not too many, uh, because of then you read the literature, there's not too many, but yes, that's what we see in reality because of CT scan plane is only one minute. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that is 50% time of a MRI. So mm -hmm. that's why we see very, very fastly. And uh, the, the uh, death vessel sign is not, uh, uh, it didn't mean that it's too high risk to thrombolize. It just mean that there's an occlusion uh, to be definite, as Hyrodian mentioned, you need a CTA. I, I do that also because of we cannot say that I rasa rasa there's occlusion. I cannot do that to the patient. So by right, we should go in and then uh, call and uh, do a CTA, then confirm, then tell the patient the risk and benefit. I always tell my fellow diagnosis, prognosis, and further management plan based on my investigation. Thank you, Dr. Rudy and also Dr. Uh, Dr. Ashraf. Okay, um, uh, anyone have any further question? If not, um, okay, tweet, tweet, tweet. Oh, Tanya. Okay, okay. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, thank you uh, for both of your input. Um, okay, Hyrodin, being a radiologist, um, CTA, you, it will require contrast. So I understand a lot of radiologists are very um, uncomfortable when it comes to patient that has uh, renal insufficiency. So I've never had any experience of requesting for patient that comes in with hyperacute stroke. But uh, what is your take if the patient has stroke, hyperacute stroke, and planning to do a CT and Joe. Um, can, can you explain a little bit on that part? Okay, so for hyperacute stroke, normally what we practice now is just uh, we just give, we just we just perform it because it's it's just uh um uh, the risk is higher compared to uh uh, uh contractinous property. So we just we normally just do it for um it, I mean we, we don't really sort of we don't really care if it comes to hyperacute stroke like if it's a, the the uh, the 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 suggestion is there is there is a uh, very clinically there's a very very high suspicion then yes we just we just uh, proceed with CTA. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, uh, anyone? I think we open for the last que uh, question from any participant. Um, okay, uh, I think if no, I think um, on behalf of our 
neuroemergency SIG, um, we would like to expose our gratitude to Dr. Hayuddin Ahmad Sangkala for support us today to give, deliver, lecture, sharing knowledge and also spending your time, your weekend time uh, with us. Thank you, Dr.